A quantum revolution is coming. Its transformational impact will transcend every sector, and the momentum for it is here. Always at the forefront, Maryland is already a leader in cybersecurity with robust IT and defense communities. With quantum computing, the University of Maryland is at the epicenter, led by one of the highest concentrations of quantum researchers in the world, including one of highest distinction. As University of Maryland researchers uncover quantum's potential, year after year, the university's well-prepared graduates enter our workforce. They're joined by STEM graduates from other prestigious institutions in Maryland, creating one of the most prepared and diverse tech workforces in the nation. The state's role in quantum is bolstered by dedicated facilities and resources, like the Quantum Startup Foundry, a quantum-focused tech incubator, market accelerator, and international soft landing in the heart of a bustling research park. Federal efforts to support the advancement of quantum research and application are rooted in Maryland, and the state is forming strategic alliances to build quantum's regional, national, and global ecosystems and supply chains. Maryland is home to one of the nation's leading quantum companies, along with a growing pipeline of quantum startups. And with all the right pieces in place to support the coming quantum revolution, we're just getting started. Maryland is the quantum state, and Maryland is open for business. All right. Anybody here want to be part of a quantum revolution? I think you already are. Thank you very much for being here. So from right here in the Discovery District, the University of Maryland is proud to lead the efforts in building and connecting our resources as the capital of quantum. Special thanks to the Maryland Department of Commerce for premiering their quantum video at our event. They're a strong partner in helping us build the quantum ecosystem, and we're grateful for their support as a sponsor of this event as well. My name is Julie Lenzer. I am the Chief Innovation Officer at the University of Maryland and the Founding Director of the Quantum Startup Foundry. I am thrilled to welcome all of our in-person attendees and the hundreds of folks who are joining us online as our first annual Quantum Investment Summit kicks off. We are powered by the Quantum Startup Foundry at the University of Maryland. So maybe folks were just ready to put on some real pants and get out of the house post-COVID, or maybe it's more about the topic. I think that's probably it. Uh, so over the next day and a half, we'll be bringing you uh, the infamous Whirly to kick us off with, I'd say, the appropriate amount of energy. Um, following that, you're going to be seeing a showcase of eight quantum companies that span the spectrum from early concepts to multi-million dollars in funding. A fireside chat with leading quantum company Cole Quanta wraps up today, and then tomorrow we'll be uh, open the day with a discussion of the current quanto, quantum ecosystem for startups and investment, followed by a group of quantum investors who are going to talk about their insights, and then finally experts discussing the business case for quantum, which is something I know that we're all very curious about. Finally, I will be joined here on stage with IonQ CEO Peter Chapman. Uh, to close out the summit with a discussion about their progress and their recent bell ringing experiences. So this is the one time we encourage you to use your phones during the event, provided, of course, that you are sharing insights via social media using the hashtag QIS2021. Um, additionally, everybody who registered should have gotten an invite to Slack, so there's an opportunity for you to continue the conversation, another way to share insights and connect uh, around the event. But before we get started, I would like to introduce another local partner helping us to build out the capital of quantum and sponsors of this summit, the Prince George's Economic Development Corporation, represented by President and CEO David Iannucci. Thank you, Julie. Uh, welcome. I am David Iannucci, the President and CEO of the Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation. And it is indeed my honor on behalf of Prince George's County Executive Angela Also Brooks uh, to welcome you to this Quantum Investment Summit held here at the University of Maryland in College Park in Prince George's County. <clears throat> I cannot overstate the importance of the University of Maryland to Prince George's County. We are a county of almost one million people in the top 4% of wealth among all counties in the United States and we led all counties in Maryland in job growth for six consecutive years. 
the, the, the university is the single most significant economic asset in Prince George's County. And we fully grasp the importance of quantum computing to the, to the university and to the county. We embrace the vision of leaders such as Dr. Pines and are committed to fully collaborating with the, with the university in supporting and promoting quantum. Much of Prince George's County's economic growth and success has been built around th the technology sector. In addition to what the university brings in innovation into many, many fields, uh, we see just down the road from us, Goddard, that's the Goddard Space Flight Center, which has technologies built right here in Prince George's County, now roaming around Mars. We see quantum computing as something that also differentiates us from other jurisdictions. A vibrant new sector that puts the University of Maryland College Park and Prince George's County on the world map. And we are, of course, thrilled by the recent success of IonQ, and we congratulate the leaders of that company on their, su on their success and the opportunities that are ahead of them. The county envisions a complete ecosystem of quantum computing built around IonQ and the University of Maryland. One other important differentiator is Prince George's County itself. With the unique demographic that leads most metropolitan areas across the United States in the number and percentage of minority scientists and engineers, in an age where equity and inclusion are finally getting the attention long deserved, this jurisdiction brings assets to the discussion that cannot be ignored. The county government, including our school system, our community colleges, our Workforce Services Agency, and of course, the Economic Development Corporation pledge our support to the university in nurturing the quantum computing industry. This quantum investment summit will explore all aspects of this exciting sector. I congratulate you all for taking time from your very, very busy schedules to be here today, and we wish you a rewarding two days in Prince George's County, Maryland. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for your support and partnership. And speaking of support, this event would not have been possible without our team on the ground. IonQ's Denise Ruffner, uh, UMD's Amanda Stein, Pyotr Kol Kolchevich, Pyotr, I always, sorry, I can't do that, Pyotr, um, Stan Smith and John Sawyer. And I also would like to recognize board members who are here. Please raise your hand, advisory board members. Uh, we have folks here from Booz Allen, MITRE, IBM, at Potomac Quantum Innovation Center. Yes, thank you so much. And I on cue. Um, so, you ready to get this party started? Ready? All right, let's do it. Um, so it is my honor to, open, to introduce our opening keynote, Whirly, or Whirley, depending on how you'd like to pronounce it. So first and foremost, Whirly provided my intro to quantum computing around three years ago with his best-selling book, Quantum Computing for Babies. That showed you where my knowledge was about three years ago. It was actually enlightening. Um, so Worley is founder and CEO of StrangeWorks, a quantum computing startup that makes the power of quantum computing easily accessible and available for all. He is an Eisenhower Fellow, innovator in residence for the Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship at the Sloan School of Management at MIT, a senior member, but not senior in age, a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, and chairman of the Quantum Computing Standards Working Group at IEEE, the first ambassador of CERN uh, and Society, a regular contributor to TechCrunch on the topic of quantum computing. Prior to starting StrangeWorks, he was a managing director at Goldman Sachs. He came to Goldman Sachs via the acquisition of his second startup, Honest Dollar, and prior to Honest Dollar, Worley founded Chaotic Moon Studios, which was acquired by Accenture. So please put it together and welcome Worley. Thank you very much. This is going to be a very different presentation for me because, one, I was told not to pace around on stage, which I do honestly. Um, giving speeches is, is not my thing. And this one's going to be a little different. Uh, I've been asked today not to talk about quantum because everyone in the room is more of an expert in quantum than I am, but to talk about the investment side of quantum, the entrepreneurial side. But when I was thinking about the speech, I thought about some things. I thought really deeply, what is a speech? 
isn't that a question? Isn't that also a question? I mean, speeches are words, repeated words, list of words, list of repeated words. See, that was a test because I brought three copies of quantum computing for babies to give away today. Since it's so popular, it's obviously the guiding light of all quantum startups. And uh, that was sarcasm. And uh, uh, I was going to give it away to anybody who caught that reference. But none of you, none of you are cool. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sad now. I have to leave. Just kidding. So look, we're going to start. It's going to be really, really simple. Uh, I don't know where the slides are for me to see. There we go. Uh, we're going to start. We're going to talk. It's going to be hard for me not to pace. It's habitual. But quantum is very exciting. Um, I got a list of questions from the organizers. What are you, uh, you know, why are you in quantum? What are you doing? What have you done? Uh, Denise and, and everybody sent some wonderful questions. So I thought I'd cover that. And I'm going to do that in probably about the next, let's call it 20 minutes. And then I'm going to leave room for questions. And those questions can be about anything. They can be about quantum, but you might embarrass me. I'm not a physicist. Uh, they can definitely be about investment, either from an investor side or from an entrepreneurial side. But what I want to do is start by, you know, giving the appropriate background they asked me to. So I am a poor kid who was a military family, grew up in Temple, Texas, and barely graduated high school. Like, that's the background. So no other PhDs, none of that. And I was going to be a touring musician. And I toured with a bunch of large funk bands that were really famous and a band that I have never named and will never name. And uh, I got in a bad car accident on Friday the 13th of 1991. And that put me in the ICU for four weeks after 13 hours of exploratory surgery and being pronounced dead a couple times. And it was insane how much that one event changed my life. Because coming out of that event, that's how I came into technology. I came into technology by taking the money from the accident and trying to build a digital recording studio and having to learn how to program in an ancient language called lingo so that I could make music and video line up. And that led to a job at Apple answering the phones. And that is the genesis of my career. After that, I invented something called the Apple Interactive Training System. I went into Apple R&D. I left Apple in 97 to go to IBM as a principal engineer. And the rest is history. I worked at a bunch of large companies. I worked at a bunch of startups. Um, I am a GP at a fund. That doesn't mean that I am some sort of great investor. I was very, very lucky that my buddy, Mike Irwin at Ecliptic Capital, wanted to work with me on, on something like that. We put together a small little $100 million perpetual fund. And so it's very interesting to be sitting on both sides of the equation because I see many of the startup presentations. I know about the SPACs early. People are always reaching out from one side or the other. And so what I'd like to do is offer my help, if it can be of help, in any way to any of you. Because, as Denise asked, why are you into quantum? What are you doing? I do believe that this technology will change the world. I believe that quantum in the next 10 years will change computing more than it's changed in the past 100. I believe that this will help solve climate change, that this will address diseases, that this will make for more secure communications. For the calculations, we need to do things like terraforming planets and becoming a multi-planet species. I do believe this is super important, but I'm also very realistic about it. And so I want to help, but I want to help in a way that drives the community forward, uh, not apart. And that's one of the problems I think I have with the community right now. Um, yeah, you can just leave my slides up if you want for me somewhere. <laughs> and, so, and so I wanted to start by talking about the serial entrepreneur stuff. Um, it, it's not that I'm great at it. I, I hate when entrepreneurs are, you know, they're like, yeah, I sold the company. It's like, we all know most of them, you didn't sell the company for much anyway, right? And, and the thing is, when an entrepreneur tells me, you know, worthy. it's going great. When I talk to you guys here and you say how great it's going, I will know one thing for sure. You're either lying to me or yourself or both of us because if you're working at a startup and you think it's going great, you should come have drinks with me tonight because I have had 21 investment exits. Uh, I have had uh, four startup sales and I can tell you, I can't think about any of them where I was like, man, that was the most amazing time of my life. I love not seeing my wife and kids or making any money and take flying the economy to like Zimbabwe. Like this is not an easy thing. Startups are hard. Startups demand all of your attention. They don't like spouses. They don't like significant others. They don't like hobbies. This is a fact. They're all consuming. They're always in one or two phases, struggling or out of business. So thank God you're struggling, right? 
That's the facts. The secret to being a good startup, the secret to being a good CEO of a startup is use it up, wear it out, make do or do without. And I'll be honest, we're gonna talk about the SPACs today, we're gonna talk about the funding and everything. I think you're all raising way too much money. Hardware's hard, I know those guys need it. The software guys don't. Apple, fund your business. Go get a loan and get a laptop, write some software in a coffee house. <laughs> you don't need 60 million, 100 million, 200 million dollars to do that. And by the way, you set yourself up for failure when you do those things. So, next slide please, or slides, thank you. So, they asked me to talk about how StrangeWorks got started and what was the purpose, and what was I thinking? And here's what I was thinking. As a serial entrepreneur, I always know what my next three or four businesses will be, and I invest in these businesses generally about 10 years in advance. So, for example, you know, technically, December 2017, StrangeWorks was founded, okay? In 2005 is when I heard about quantum mechanics, anything potentially being a business opportunity. Uh, in 2008 is when I invested, you know, like 25 grand in just like some research from some students. And then I just gradually accelerated that. So when I sold our last company to Goldman Sachs, and I was leaving because clearly I am Goldman material, right? We all know that. Uh, I had to, a choice. What was I going to do? It was going to be biohacking, it was going to be quantum, or it was going to be robotics. And I chose quantum, and I'll tell you why. Because the first company we did, Chaotic Moon, was for fun and profit. It was models and bottles. We built most of the apps you use. Some of the stuff we wrote is still resident on all of your phones, okay? And it was amazing. It was one of the greatest times of my life. Everybody made a bunch of money. The partnership blew up, you know, all the stuff you hear, the classic tales of a, of a startup, you know, that goes from zero to hero that fast. Um, but if I could do it all again, I would. I learned more through that pressure and that pain than I've ever learned in my career. And that company was for fun and profit. The second company, Honest Dollar, was our attempt to be those mythical founders, the ones you read about on Entrepreneur Magazine and Inc. Magazine and all. I'm here to tell you I know people have been on those magazines and I've read those stories and they don't line up with the reality I saw them live. <laughs> and I can tell you that those things are romance novels for startup geeks. That's a fact, okay? And so that company was more like, let's save the world. And it was savings-based, average American has a $400 expense, they're insolvent, you know, let's help give them a way to save, that's not trying to steal all their money in basis points. It was super successful, and it was great. But I wasn't satisfied. This one, the reason I chose quantum over biohacking and robotics was one, biohacking legislation and regulation is gonna really be hard for somebody like me to handle or, or adhere to, so it sounds like a bad plan. Um, and, and robotics, you know, Boston Robotics has been sold and sold again and sold again and all these companies, and there's a lot of turmoil in that market. By the way, I worry that that could be the near-term future for quantum. Lots of coming together, breaking apart, coming back together. This is the path we're on right now from a pure economic standpoint, okay? Just looking at the, at the numbers. So I wanted to do something that was gonna change the world. But I don't wanna change the world. I have no desire to have a, you know, Nobel Prize. I don't need to find a cure for cancer. I wouldn't mind being part of helping save the planet. That's a big one for me. But I'm not doing this for money or for fame or for anything other than helping everyone bring quantum into the world. And that's why I had that Linux penguin on that slide, if we bring that up again. And um, that, that was how StrangeWorks got started. Goldman Sachs, I told them they should get into quantum. They weren't quite ready. It was before Will Zing and everybody. They have an amazing team now. I love all those guys. And I said, well, give me permission to go do stuff on my own. And I did. And I went to my friend, Brian Balendorf, who founded Apache. I have a long open source history. And Jim Zimlin, who runs the Linux Foundation. And Linus, and I said, we should do a giant quantum open source project as a Linux Foundation. And uh, Andrew uh, and Landon from One Qubit had already had a similar proposal, and we got everybody together, and then I got a bunch of people I'm not gonna name together at an office from a company that's here that I'm not gonna name in San Francisco. And I kid you not, this would be the summer of 2017. They fought like cats and dogs. F you, no F you, no F you. My tech's better, well you know, annealers are better than this, and this is better than that. And I was like, but we need software, and we need really good software fast. Quantum computers will have all the issues of mainframes. Geographically dispersed resource, time sharing, job scheduling, all of these. There's so many boring things we're not doing, which is why we're not seeing the uptick in investment uh, from the enterprise, right? Because we can't not only give them a, a problem, we can't fit into their architecture. 
this is, a, this is an issue. But the project started as Linux Foundation, and in that meeting in the summer of 2017, I said, you know what, screw it. I'll just build a company, start another company, and do it myself. And that's how Strangeworks was started. So if anybody doesn't like us in this space as a startup, then that's kind of your fault, <laughs> because we we're gonna do it all for free. But, next slide, please. But uh, that leads us to, you know, what is Strangeworks doing? Look, we've been purposely um, uh, not so great at telling everybody. There's no crazy secret. We're not working on any amazing patents. We're building core software that touches every aspect of it, if you will, a spanning layer across quantum that will hopefully help all of you bring all of your algorithms and hardware and technologies around quantum into the enterprise better and faster and cheaper so that we can actually get this industry kicked off in a big way. The potential we have is unlimited. The impossibilities are endless. But we have to have a lot more collaboration, and we have to really start working together on a number of these uh, um, issues that we're facing, uh, whether it be noise control. I think what we tend to do is we pick out an issue, we say, that's my prize, that's my patent, that's my, my company. Some of these things aren't companies, right? Some of these things are just software. They're just tools. They're just things people are going to need, that people are going to use. But they don't have any uh, revolutionary purpose. But you cannot enter the enterprise if we try to recreate the wheel. And so the main thing we want to do at Strangeworks is fit things into the way people work, not try to make people. I'm not pitching a quantum workflow. They already have a workflow. They spent millions of dollars to establish that workflow. We have to fit into what they have, not ask them to fit into us, right? We have to fit in the existing HPC systems. We have to do all of these things. So if you think of Strangeworks, maybe think of it like a system management company, like a Tivoli or a BMC or something of that flavor. But we have a lot more potential and we have a lot bigger plans. But the thing that I get asked already four times this morning is, why haven't you raised a Series A? We're going to very soon, probably before the end of the year. But we haven't needed to yet. Why do people ask that? Because we've raised $4 million, okay? In, we're coming up on December, will be our five year, we'll start our fifth year in business, all right? People have raised hundreds of millions. My nearest competitor, over 100 million. They have 130 people. I have no idea what any of those people do. And that's okay. We have 14 people in a little office in Austin. We're like the ZZ Top of Quantum or something, right? But the thing is, is that this is important. This is the thing. I fear the amount of capital coming into it. Because how many of you know the Mythical Man Month? Anybody? I want to talk to all of those people at drinks later, because they understand. Because in 1971, a very brilliant guy wrote a book about IBM software and management. He noticed that when you put more money on a project that was behind, when you put more people on a project that was behind, it got further and further and further behind. Because when you're doing software, and this is just for all my software friends in the room, you do not need a lot of people. When I was at Apple and R&D, Tiger Team, seven people. That was the most. You know, we have 14 people, not all of them are software engineers. We don't have more than four or five working on any one part of the components, right? This is important. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make some announcements in January. We're going to release some new software. We've already given it to some of you uh, under NDA. And all it's there to do is help get people who need the machines to your machines, who need the algorithms to your algorithms, right? We should be your number one ally in building your business in the enterprise. That's the role we want to play, right? That is the role that I'd like to see the company do. I'll get that slide up again. So, talking about the funding, woo! <laughs> if we can leave this up for me, that'd be great. Um, talking about the funding, uh, I don't understand the round dynamics that are happening in quantum right now. I think they're utterly insane. And I do believe that a market crash is coming, and I do believe that is gonna dramatically factor. it. Nick Farina from AeroQ and I have this argument all the time, because he sees the public markets and the private markets as two separate pools of capital. But I see them as ever increasingly getting together closer and closer. Because yeah, you got the people on Reddit. They can bring the movie company back, right? Uh, but they can also destroy a quantum company, you know? And yeah, you got the big money coming in from the institutionals and the VCs, but they're not a battle, right? Most strategics are now deciding to hire people out of VCs and just invest the money directly. Right off the balance sheet, why wouldn't they? They can take a long-term view on something like quantum, right? They can put together the right resources, they already have customers and sales and people they can channel stuff to. This is why I think you see deals like CQC and Honeywell and stuff happen, right? That's a smart deal because Honeywell has a lot of government contracts. They have a lot of access. 
um, I think you're gonna see more of those deals. But in funding, I think you're gonna see funding cool down. I think you're already seeing it cool down. If you look at some of the markdowns, because there's been 16 down rounds out of 45 companies that I'm tracking on my hot list, okay? But 500 that I watch worldwide. If you look at the markdowns, you're talking about companies going from 140, 200 million down to 40, 50. You're talking about companies going from 360 into Europe down to 70, right? And you're seeing valuations go up and you're seeing some, some accretive stuff for the people that hold shares and the employees. But most of these employees aren't gonna be underwater on their options. Like you've done a fourth round of hundreds of millions of dollars. As an engineer, what's my stock worth? Why am I working for you? Why don't I start my own company, right? If you look at the percentages given up in these rounds, a lot of these companies have lost control of their own company. This is vitally important because you're not in an industry. We're in a thing we want to be in industry. We're not in market transformation, we're in market creation. And that is extremely, extremely hard. And when you think about creating markets, we, that's why I push on the collaboration. So I push on the management of these startups to be a little more tight, a little more constrained. Use it up, wear it out, make do, do without. If you're not doing it, you got a fancy office? I don't. You got somebody who cleans your office? I, I think we clean our office. Somebody does your lawn service? If you look at the front of StrangeWorks right now, we need to get a weed eater out there, stat, okay? That is being a startup. And I worry that a lot of us are confusing being a startup with being an established company, established industry. And that will lead to something that will hurt everybody. And just like that, I can't go open source and everything in the world either, right? Like, I mean, there's all of these things. It's a balance. That's what we need. Um, funding, and I'm gonna save time for Q&A uh, for about 10 minutes. Feel free to ask any questions you want. Funding is going to change dramatically in quantum. I am right now looking at the next big events between now and the end of the year being a $100 million round, a $360 million round, and a $4 billion seed pre-money valuation with almost a billion dollars invested. I don't think any of that makes sense. It doesn't mean I don't believe in quantum. It doesn't mean I don't believe there aren't trillions of dollars. And as an investor, I'm all in on quantum. And as an entrepreneur, I'm all in on quantum. This is the biggest opportunity of our lifetimes. This is, as I said in my opening presentation for StrangeWorks at South by in 2018, the space race of this generation. I believe that it will unlock so many things. But if we screw up the funding, or we screw up the companies, we see it. And here's how you tell the funding is screwed up. The options are bad. And you tell the options are bad by watching on LinkedIn how many people move from company to company to company, trying to reset that bell, right? This is a problem. Your employees are everything. My employees are gold. If you go to the Twitter, I was joking with Denise and Andre earlier. I, uh, Yesterday, I needed Andrew Ochoa, one of my physicists, and uh, kind of my right hand there in Austin. I said, uh, hey, I need you on Slack. I put a screenshot of it, and he said, uh, can't talk right now, watching Bjork concert stream live. Cannot pause. What's up? And I said, best answer ever. And then later, he texted me and said, he messaged me on Slack, and he said, uh, concert's over. How can I help? <laughs> I heard somebody, when I told that joke a couple weeks ago, go, I would have fired that guy. And even Andre made a joke, I'd have fired that guy. The first person said he'd fired him because of insubordination stuff. Hey, if you have a startup and you're already trying to run it like a Fortune 500 company, you are screwed, <laughs> okay? This is not how software engineers work. And by the way, we're learning how to work with PhDs, but like software engineers are worse than PhDs in a lot of ways. I mean, we can be divas. So, you know, we gotta, we gotta get this stuff. We gotta make sure these people are treated right. We gotta make sure these options are gonna have value. We can't be deluding people. We can't be moving people. We can't be like, you know what? I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. I'm moving. Or I don't agree with you and you and you and you're, we're fired. Like we have to keep teams together. My team has been together between eight and 27 years. The primary reason that they've been together that long is because we take care of them first. And I know there's a lot of investors in the room and I just said I'm about to raise a series A and roll that process out, but listen to me. Listen, I treat the employees number one. The investors are number two. Everyone else comes in the list after that. Because without those employees, there is no company. And we already have a workforce shortage in this industry, a huge workforce shortage. The first master's students are just now coming out of school with six years of academic experience, probably no life experience or startup experience, and that's our talent pool right now. 
and we're trying to manufacture it, so please treat your people well. Let's look at those slides again, please. So, the one everybody wants to talk about. Now, I, I'm pretty proud of this slide, because uh, for those of you who have never had to do manual labor, in high school I had to spackle a lot of stuff, except uh, it has a K, so I thought we'd just drop the K and make it spackling. Um, everyone asked me about the SPACs. Look, it's a legitimate way to get to market. It's in rounding a process that is there to protect both the public investors and your company. I, could, I have concerns about that. Um, I saw the Rigetti SPAC, congratulations to them. Obviously, INQ just de -spacked. Here's the thing I'm confused on. Every press release I read says, we're the first whatever, whatever, whatever. We're the first this, we're the first that. We're the first publicly traded quantum company. Like, I hate to burst everybody's bubble, but that was a little beverage company called Quantum Computing Inc. that everybody laughed at. And, and I mean, you know, is it a pump and dump scam? Is it whatever? It was very early. They're raising money. They're hiring real people, right? They deserve, with all the shade you could throw at them, as much respect as any of the rest of us. Because right now, again, there is no industry. It's about to happen. My prediction, 23, 2023 to 2026 are the boom years. 2023 is gonna be like 1963, when Jack stepped out and said, here's a microprocessor. And nobody was thinking about the internet or autonomous vehicles or AI or any of that. And we in this room and the people watching this online will be the ones that create the industry that will present that next giant opportunity. And it's gonna be amazing. Next uh, slide, please. Here's our biggest fear. 16 of us were mentioned in a commerce briefing that I was given a little insight to last two weeks. Commerce does import and export laws among their many responsibilities. And if we continue to beef up the hype on it's gonna break all the encryption and it's gonna destroy the world and all of this great stuff, you will be regulated out of existence. Because if your quantum computer can't be used outside of the United States starting next year, for the next 10 years, you're not gonna have enough customers to have enough money to build your company or for us to build an industry. Everybody should be talking to their congressmen and their senators. Everybody should be hiring a lobbyist. I have dozens if you need them. And we should be representing, hey, this makes us stronger as a country, not weaker. And we should have everybody else do that too. Australia's looking at recommendation, uh, regulations. Britain's looking at regulations. Everyone's looking at regulations. Germany, France. And that will be the biggest threat to quantum right now outside of ourselves. So with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to take any questions. I'll put that last slide up. Well, I'll take any questions except for Andre or Denise. No, I'm just kidding. Andre, what's up? Diligent, diligence with time, diligence with time, right? I turned down a $50 million round. My team is very upset with me. Person offered me 50 on a 200. We met for a little less than an hour. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can do that. And they are very famous and they got extremely upset. And I said, I don't understand why you're upset. Said, I'm one of the greatest investors, blah, 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 whatever. I said, oh, no, but, but I told you I was looking for investors, and you're not an investor. I said, what do you mean I'm not an investor? I said, look, if you meet me for less than an hour, and you offer me $50 million on any valuation, you're not an investor. And they said, well, then what the hell am I? I said, you're a gambler. And that's what we have in quantum right now. So my advice would be use time to diligence. Somebody's like, oh, my God, this quantum round is closing. Uh, everybody's coming in. Got to get you in by Friday. That is my first big red flag that I should not write you a check. Right? I have the opposite problem at Strangeworks, Andre, as you know, because I know investors have reached out to you and been like, what's his problem? They're like, hey, we'll do a deal. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, soon, 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 we'll do it. It's just because you have to use time to diligence, and you have to diligence investors. You know, Andre, you asked that for investors. Use time as diligence, focus on the fundamentals. See if there's a business there. Don't, your job is not to understand, as an investor, the superposition or entanglement. Your job is to understand, will the business take the dollar I give them and turn it into more dollars? And if so, how many do I think? That's your job. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your limited partners, okay? So that would be my straight. And on the other side of that, for entrepreneurs, 
You need to diligence the investors. Ask them for a DDQ. Watch what they say when you do that. I always watch when I'm talking to investors. I go, no problem, we'll just need to start our diligence process. I'm gonna need your LPA, your limited partner agreement, and your DDQ, your due diligence questionnaire. And they're like, what? Because entrepreneurs don't ask for that. But you should, because the DDQ will tell you everything you need to know about the fund. The LPA will tell you how they're treating the investors, because guess what? They can treat them better than you, so if they're not treating them great, you're screwed, right? These are things that you need to know. Other questions? None of you have a question? All right, well, I, oh, there, now there's too many hands. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. How, do, how, do, how did we start building software? And it's, I've talked about it's a nascent space and all this stuff. So we took a approach. So we partnered with Stack Overflow, and we built a community that's now around 17,000 people, and then we financially sponsored some around the world, uh, Japan, other places. And we basically just started talking to all those people, and then I interviewed over the last four years almost 300 enterprises. And, um, you know, spoiler alert, they're not ready for quantum. <laughs> And even if they want it, they don't have anybody who can use it. So we got to fix that. That workflow's problem is going to be a real pain. But we took that from the community, and we just threw stuff against the wall to see what would stick. And we built the initial platform, the initial structure, and got a lot of enthusiasts on it and started watching. What are people doing with it? How are they doing refactoring? For us, it's all about constant refactoring. So the change we're going to make to the software uh, that is already, like I said, in a couple of your hands that we're gonna, maybe we'll do it before January, but I, I think it's a great way to start the new year. So, and there's, there's no impetus, there's no rush. So why not do it in January? That software will be, to some people, a little bit of a shock of how different it is. Um, to most people, they're gonna be like, oh, this is way better. Because we listen to the people that are using the tools. Doesn't matter if you're an enthusiast or a researcher or an investor or whatever, anybody that has information and opinions, I can sift through them later, but I want all of that. That's why I watch all of these companies, watch all of the releases, track all of the finances, because information and design are the two greatest weapons in quantum right now. Because the hardware, nobody understands it except the people building it, or at least as good. Some people do, professors, et cetera, et cetera, but in the enterprise, zero, right? Nobody. And so you have to be able to know what's going on in the market and to communicate what's going on in the market, and you have to be able to, to sell your position in the market. Um, look, we've done a, 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 what we wanted to do. Um, we're kind of like Dr. Frankenfurter of quantum startups. We're like, we didn't build it for you. So uh, you know, if, if you don't like it, that's perfectly fine. But I think we're gonna really, really enjoy um, the, the, the fruits of building the, the, the very low, rough stuff. And the only way we're gonna do that is not to rest on our loyals. Constant refactoring, constant reworking, taking criticism. I love criticism. If any of you have been on quantumcomputing.com and have complaints about it, I would love to hear them. Because that's what we do. We listen, we take it, we have a super fast development velocity, we make the changes, we get it out. We A-B test, we do all the great things that you should be doing in any startup. So, and I saw two more, yes sir. That's great. Um, when I say boomers, I think there's a decent opportunity in consulting right now. As you know, in, on the software side that I sit on, that's what almost everybody does. We do not do consulting. Um, the, I mean, at most, we'll like, help you get started with the software or something a little bit, but uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot more money. You're starting to see Deloitte and Accenture and other people who have had quantum stuff start to actually do some stuff with customers and move. And um, there's gonna be another conference uh, where we'll actually talk about a consulting partner and some of the cool stuff they've been doing. I think that Everybody's looking at it wrong, and I know that this will come back to bite me, and people will not, this will not be a popular statement, but I, I don't care. I want, I want to help, and, and the truth will set us free. But right now, when you're looking at where the booms, where the opportunities are, stop trying to break it into industries you think you have money. Because you see everybody say pharma, finance, all of this, and I agree, they have complicated problems, right? But you're not saying that because they have complicated problems. You're saying that because you're like, they have a lot of money. So they could help us build this stuff to solve complicated problems. And that's the truth. And so for, for us, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as 
any problem, any calculation that you're trying to execute, where you add a number of variables, uh, Michelle Simmons in Australia uses the traveling salesperson pro, pro, uh, example. There, there's a ton of these examples, right? They're irrelevant. But you add a few variables, the evaluation time skyrockets. So now all of a sudden, I can't do it on my laptop, I need a supercomputer. I can't do it on a supercomputer, it's gonna take months or years or hundreds of years or millions of years. Though, that is the problem focus and I'm gonna tell you, those problems don't exist yet because we have a chicken and an egg problem in quantum. And the chicken and egg problem is that we have this technology, we want to apply to all of these problems, and we're searching for problems. And so what we're doing as an industry is we are going out and we are looking at all of the enterprise and finding problems we think it would good. You know what that's the equivalent of, guys? Ladies and gentlemen, that is, this is like being in the early days of computing saying, it's only need for four computers in the world, or saying, ooh, this is gonna make spreadsheets amazing, and they're a rock. Quantum computing, I have no interest in applying it to the problems of today. I have every fiber in my being to apply it to the problems of tomorrow. The there will be a de delineation point, a demarcation point in the history of this industry in which we will go from quantum fiction to quantum fact. And when we do, we will have so many new industries. So I mean, think of all the things that came out of the microprocessor, right? Cellular communications, everything, your, your apps. Your, your internet, the AI, all of these things. What is gonna come out of quantum? I mean, does that not get you excited? How could that not get you excited? That gets me excited, but we're not gonna do it by trying to retrofit this amazing tomorrow technology to, oh, well, you know, we're trying to do a quantum Monte Carlo to uh, do a portfolio management. I'm not saying it can't be useful there. I'm just saying that's not having our eyes on the prize. We all go out and talk about changing the world, right? And all of these things, and then we go, quantum can do those spreadsheets? extremely, extremely well. No, it can't. Excel's great. You know what's great at a quantum Monte Carlo? Excel. I, I challenge anybody who's doing those, their quantum computer against my chief strategy officer with Excel. <laughs> it's, you know, we need to solve real problems, problems that we haven't discovered. And so when you have a chicken and the egg problem, what do you need? You need a rooster. And that rooster is everybody collaborating, hopefully a spanning layer like ours being very freely available for people to work through, education, right, uh, partnerships on, on, on algorithms, open sourcing of algorithms. I, I know a lot of people have been watching all the patents on algorithms. Um, not supposed to patent math. Algorithms kind of math. I know you're getting around it. Don't do that. I'll give you a free one. You want to make a patent? Patent the lattice. Patent the physical structure of those atoms. There's a ton of stuff you can patent, not the algorithms, because I'm just going to go and invalidate those so that they become open, because everybody needs those. You got something super special? Patent it somewhere else. Don't patent the math, that's not fair. And, and by the way, if you're an investor, those patents aren't worth much. You're not gonna fund them fighting IBM or Google or somebody in a patent battle for the next 10 or 12 years, are you? No, so why are they spending money on patents anyway? Hundreds of thousands of dollars you guys are spending on patents. So you can say you had a patent and you can try to use it to, val to value the company and raise money. Value of a patent 10 years ago was set at about $523,000. If you take every acquisition in history, take the number of patents those companies had when they were acquired, and you divide it, in almost every case, it comes plus or minus, I think it was like ten to $40,000 of that number, okay? I'm not saying patents aren't valuable. In hardware, you absolutely have to do stuff, right? There's a ton of stuff there. But let's focus our attention on the prize. Let's go out, let's work together, let's drive this industry forward, let's get the adoption we so desperately need to keep things moving at the pace that we've set them at with the hype, and let's execute. I don't wanna hear about experiments and being run on a machine for free where the press release makes it sound like you made some money. I wanna hear somebody gave you $10 million over three years to do something with quantum, because then we all benefit. Like a rising tide floats all boats. We really need to be in this together. And that is what I'm gonna end on because that is really the only message I have for everyone here today. I will help you with entrepreneurship, with the investment side, battling investors, you know, helping find funding. I know a ton of investors. I'll do anything I can for any one of you. But we have to work together because quantum will change the world, but it's up to us to change quantum. Thank you very much.